It seems to me that too many Christians today are walking around judging other people and judging themselves based on action and performance and if you do this, if you'll do that, if you do this or the other thing, then you're going to go to hell. That is not what Christianity is about. Christianity is not a religion. Religion tells you that if you don't do this, 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 and this, that you're going to go to hell. Jesus didn't say, if you do this, this, and this, and this, you're going to go to hell. He said, I love you. The law and the prophets were until John. And the law and the prophets tell us that we're not good enough. They remind us that we are inferior, that we are naked in the sight of God, that we are exposed, and that we are and never will be good enough. As Paul put it, I was alive once, but then the law came and sin revived and I died. What is he saying? He's saying, for example, if I coveted, it was a subconscious thing. I didn't consciously know I was coveting something. But as soon as the law told me, don't covet, guess what I wanted to do? I started covering, coveting other people's cars, other people's shoes, other people's clothes, other people's styles, their lives, whatever have you. And that's because the law reminds us that we're not good enough, that we can't keep it. It reminds us of sin and reminds us that we will never be good enough. And that is the curse of the knowledge of good and evil that Adam understood when he became a man of understanding that he gained the knowledge of good and evil of how good and holy God is and how inferior compared to him we are but the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is what the world needs to hear is that God became flesh and called himself the son that the son of God that is God himself became flesh lived a blameless life in which he was tempted in every way that we will ever be tempted, in every possible way a man can be tempted, including levels that we'll never ever begin to understand, and he died on a cross. He who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And that's saying he took our sin, our nature, our inferiority, are not being good enough and he said you are no longer not good enough I have made you good enough I have made you holy I have made you spotless and without blame you know there's an old saying I was I'm a sinner saved by grace or he made it as though I've never sinned but in God's eyes, once you've accepted the blood of Christ, once you've accepted the gift of God, it became, you. Ne it's not as if you never sinned. In God's eyes, you never sinned. You were blameless, holy, upright, and without fault before God. Your spirit passed from death into life and became a new spirit and is and the Holy Spirit came into our hearts and sealed that and said, You are a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things are made new. And your spirit will never be made more perfect or any less perfect than it already is at the moment of salvation. What we're doing is working out our soul salvation with fear and trembling. And that means hearing the Word of God, listening to the Word of God, abiding in the Word of God, listening to what the Holy Spirit tells us to do because He will show us what we are to do. He is the one that gives us the power to live a holy, blameless, and overcoming life. He is the one that teaches and releases that power into our spirit, into our soul, and allows us to live. It's not about being perfect or having it all together. So if you're a Christian out there and think that you're not good enough because you don't act perfect or you have to not go to bars or not do this and not do that in order to be saved or you're not allowed to, to even laugh or have fun or have joy. You have to be pious and do everything perfect. You can't risk even saying the remotest thing wrong. Well, I've got news for you. That's just not true. Being a Christian is not about being perfect and having it all together and it's false sense of piety that you're somehow better than everybody else based on your actions because you don't go to bars or you don't smoke or you don't drink. Now, of course, none of those things are beneficial to do, to get drunk and to do things. 
nor are you better because you're a vegetarian or you don't eat this kind of meat or that kind of meat. If God tells you not to eat meat, then don't eat meat. Because whatever you do outside of faith to you, it's sin. But that's not the source of your life. Jesus is. So if you're preaching to others and condemning others because you hate yourself, just lighten up. Let, let off yourself. Accept what Jesus did for you and let it go. And if you're a Christian going around condemning other Christians and other people in the world and telling them they're going to hell and they're not good enough, they're not good enough, stop it. First of all, judge not lest you be judged. In the same measure you use to judge others will be measured back to you. You do not have the right to judge your fellow man and tell them they're going to hell. Furthermore, they already know that. Do you think they don't realize that they're not good enough? Do you don't think the world doesn't realize it's not good enough? Why do you think millions of dollars are spent each year on advertising saying you're not good enough? If you don't wear Nikes, you're not good enough. If you don't... Uh, use a certain type of deodorant, you're not good enough. If you don't use a certain type of body spray, you're not good enough. If you buy this product, if you buy this toothpaste, the girls will be attracted to you more because you'll have more sex appeal. Or because you wear this particular body spray, the girls are going to come rushing to you and jump you. Yeah, right. Um, sure. But they're appealing to that, I'm not good enough, so if I wear this, then I'll be good enough. If I dress this certain way, I'll be good enough. If I have this job or this car or this thing, it'll be good enough. But your sufficiency doesn't come from all that. The world knows that. The world needs to know that there is a God who became flesh, who died for their sins to make them good enough. That they are loved just the way they are. That they can come to God just the way they are and that they can have life and life to the fullness. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That he loved us while we were still sinners. That he loved us even while we weren't good enough. And that's what the world needs to know. That's what the world needs to hear. Not a bunch of condemnation, condemnation. So I'm telling you Christians, stop acting according to the law. Stop walking according to the law of Moses because the law was until the law and the prophets were till John. And now the kingdom of God is suffered violence and the violent take it by force. That means those who desire to be holy, those who desire to follow God, those who desire to enter the kingdom of God may do so. And they may do so with their whole heart. For God judges the heart, not the outward appearance. That's why it says, Fear God and give man fear God and give him glory, for this is man's all. For God will judge every intent of the heart, whether good or evil. And in Revelations it says, I am he who searches the hearts, that they may know that I am he who searches the hearts and minds of men. But God doesn't search it out. To see what sin, just to see what sin we have to condemn us, but he searches out our hearts to see what he can give to our credit. You know, God said to me many years ago that I'm proud of you, not because you're perfect, but because of what you desire to be. God is proud of you because of who you are. He loves you for who you are. He loves the people of this world for who they are. He fashioned them in their mother's womb before they were ever born. He knew them and he measured out their days. He counted the number of hairs on their head and he said, I have a plan. I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you hope and a future, plans to prosper you and not to see you harm. And he goes on to say in Matthew that he's, I, the, the lamb will say in that day, you did not visit me in prison. You did not come to me when I was sick. You did not clothe me. You did not do all these things unto me. And they'll say, when did we not do this to you? And he will say to them, when you didn't do to this, to these things to the least of my brethren, you did not do it to me. And he will say to the others, when I did these things, I was clothed, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in distress and you comforted me and so on. And they will say, Lord, when did we do these things? And he said, whatever you did to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Therefore, whatever you don't do to your fellow man, you do to God. You don't do to Christ. And whatever you do to your fellow man, you did to Christ. Both good and evil. It works both ways. You know, we preach that 
saying, whatever I do to my brother, I'm doing it to Christ, so that's why I should love my brother. And that's true, but it also works in the negative. If when you're rude or nasty or mean or you condemn your brother to hell, you are condemning Christ who died for them. You are doing it to him. And it is said, Jesus said, by your words you will be acquitted and by your words you will be condemned and we will give an account for every idle and hateful word we ever spoke. Now the blood covers that if we truly believe, but we will stand up and give an account for every word. And we will feel the guilt of every evil and hateful thing we say. The difference is at the end, Jesus will stand up and say, but remember my blood. Permit even this and forgive even this. Just as he said when he healed Malchus's ear, permit even this. Because he was demonstrating that even while he was being struck, he had the power to forgive. So stop preaching the law and the prophets and condemning your fellow man. Stop condemning yourself. Live in the new life that is in yours in Christ Jesus. It's like when the Pharisee asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the other is like it. That means equal to it or just as important or one in the same as the first. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Because you cannot say you love God whom you've never seen if you do not love your brother whom you have seen. And when you disrespect your fellow man and when you disrespect your brother in Christ, you're disrespecting the Christ who died for them also. And when you disrespect your fellow human being, your neighbor, you are disrespecting God. And nothing offends God more than disrespect. For disrespect is just another form of pride and arrogance. It's a form of saying you are better than them, that they don't matter. And Jesus said, went so far as to say how Dare you say that you're better than your brother, that your brother doesn't matter, that he's inferior and that you're better than anyone. He even went so far as to say the Pharisees had the attitude, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But because you say you see, your sin remains. And if you do not repent, you will die in your sin. That's pretty harsh. That's telling, Jesus is telling you, I take that very seriously, how you treat your neighbor. It's akin as to loving me with all your heart, because you cannot say you love me with all your heart and hate your brother without a cause. You can't do it. It's not the hate of the Lord that brings people to salvation. It's not the depression of the Lord. It's not the condemnation of the Lord. It's the joy of the Lord. It's the love of the Lord. You cannot expect people to serve God out of fear because fear is not love. God doesn't want people to serve them because he's terrified of them, of him. He wants people to serve them him because he loves them, because they love him. That's what he meant when he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It wasn't, we have to keep his commandments to prove we love him. It was, if you fall in love with me, you will keep my commandments. Those of you who have a significant other, whether it be boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, you don't do things for them to prove your love to them. You do things for them because you love them. Because you love them and you want to lighten their burden, you want to lighten their load, you cook supper or you do the dishes or you take out the trash or you do the vacuuming or something, seeing that your partner is stressed out and that they've had a bad day or whatever, you go out of your way to bless them and to make their time easier, to make their life easier, to, to encourage them, to help them because you love them. You don't do it out of obligation or begrudgingly because, oh, if I don't, my, my, my husband will hate me or my wife will hate me. At least I hope not. If that's how your marriage is, then you need to get it under Christ because that's not a marriage. I don't know what that is, but that's not love. And you need to find some love in your marriage and you can only do that by finding the love of the Father. But if you have that true marital love and true relationship love, whatever stage it may be, you do things for them because you love them. And that's what Jesus was saying. If you fall in love with me and love me with all your heart, doing my commands is not going to be a problem. 
Because my parent, my commands are not burden them, burdensome. The majority of my commands are common sense. Doing to others as you'd have them do to you is not some great hidden spiritual wisdom. It's basic human common sense. It doesn't take a lot of effort to treat another person how you'd want to be treated. It's that simple. You wouldn't want to be snapped at, talked down to, treated like someone else is better than you. You wouldn't be talked down to and treated like you're not good enough, so don't do it to others. So get out there. Preach the love of God. Preach the forgiveness of sins. Treat, Teach how God makes you sufficient. How He is your sufficiency. He is your love, your joy, your peace, your righteousness. Not your works. Him. As it is written, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Not by works, lest any man should boast, but it is the gift of God. We all know the wages of sin is death. We get it. You don't have to keep telling them. They know the terrible news of sin. They know the terrible news of murder and hatred and evil that is in people's hearts. He said, go forth and preach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not the terrible news. The good news. That they can have love and joy and peace and faithfulness. That they can be holy as he is holy because he makes them holy. And you shall not call common what God has called clean as it is written. Therefore, whether they be redeemed neighbors or unredeemed neighbors, treat them with the love and respect that every human deserves. Treat them with the love, dignity, and honor every living being deserves. And show them the love of God, not in your words and shoving it down people's throats, but with demonstration and power by living a joyful life, by living a peaceful life, by living so full the peace and love and joy of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit that they say, I want what you have. Whatever it is that gives you so much joy and so much peace in the midst of trial, whatever gives you so much of a joyful heart, we want that. It is said by one of the, saint, the Catholic saints, not that I put much stock in it, but this guy was wise. Go forth through all the earth and preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. Preach the gospel with your life, not just your words. Don't be a seer and a sayer of the word, but a doer of the word. And you'll see your life transformed into, with so much joy, with so much peace, with so much hope, that will burst and overflow, press down, shaken and overflowing from, flow from you, and you will become a vessel so full of living water that the scripture will be filled. Out of you will flow rivers of living water. And you will become a tree of... You are a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. And all the trees of the fields, that is us, the trees of righteousness, shall clap their hands and we shall go forth in joy and shall go out in peace. Or vice versa. So build a relationship with Christ and then go forth and preach the gospel as a living sacrifice, as a living testimony. As the scripture says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So let us be vessels of mercy. Let us be vessels of honor. Let us be vessels that proclaim the love and dignity that God has given each and every man, no matter what, whether they be a poor person on the street or the mightiest king, all are equal in God's sight. And no one is better or worse than anyone else in God's sight. Not one single sparrow falls without the Master knowing, without Jesus knowing, and we are worth more than many sparrows, so let's not be of little faith. So stop hating yourself, stop hating those around you, accept the gift of God that God has for you, and then freely you've received, freely give. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So let the Holy Spirit fill your heart with love and joy and peace and all the fruits of the Spirit. 
so that we might have good fruit because it says we are the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, whose leaves and fruit are for the healing of the nations, for they bear their fruit in season. And remember, above all, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love.